Good morning, Anne Claire. Good afternoon, Meg. Guy, why do we have to live in two separate continents? This just confuses me. I know, I know. It's okay. Once or twice a year, we are on the same continent. That's true, which I'm so excited because the retreat's in, what, like two-ish months, like two and a half months? I'm not what's today? March. 22nd of March, so. Okay, so like two and a half months, maybe? We'll be... Oh, I'm so excited. We'll get to hang out in Portugal together. We'll get to be in the valley, which is so peaceful and grounding. I can't wait to be in nature. Oh, it's going to be nice. I know. It's so cute. We have several members who now have a little countdown on their phones <gasps> of like X days until the retreat. And I love it. I'm not going to lie. Every time someone screenshots, like it becomes like a round day or something. They're like, X number of days before the retreat. And every time I'm like, <laughs> so, anyway, countdown thing on my phone. That sounds like so exciting. It's I, so I, cute. I, I love it. Help me like recognize that it's coming up and we have some work to do, but we're getting there. Oh, we're good. We yeah. are so good. I mean, let's be real. We have way too many ideas of things we want to do. It's more so hard to limit ourselves than to find the ideas, but... <laughs> I just can't wait to be out in nature, you know, at nighttime, in the bright early mornings. Like you're really outdoors all day unless you're sleeping or in the like yoga room, which is basically like you're outdoors. Cause it's, right. It's, it's just so magical because there's like the windows are just open on the valley. Oh. And so even if you're inside, you're in the valley, like you're outside, even though you're inside sort of a thing, it's just, yes. ugh. It feels different. It really nourishes everyone in this such a special way. Mm, anyway, I say the yoga room, which is called the shala, right? I, I'm saying that correctly, right? The yoga yes. shala. It's literally built so as if you're hanging over the valley. So you have this stunning bird's eye view of the valley while you're doing yoga or doing a workshop or journaling, and it's just extremely peaceful and gorgeous. I do, I do not know on, on which side I am, so somewhere. <laughs> Are we going to start doing the dance again? No. No, we're not dancing. We, we are answering a question. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. It's like, Megan's like, I wanted to dance. Dancing. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I love talking about recovery. Obviously. If we Obviously. could dance and talk about recovery at the same time, though, I think that'd be my preferred method. You know someone's going to come up and say, well, you could just do TikTok dances and point to recovery things, but I'm not doing that. You can, but I'm not entering TikTok. I can do the points, but as far what? as... The you have such amazing dance moves, Meg. Come on. I am actually only good at non-choreographed dance. Ah, it's if, fine. If someone was like, do this cool TikTok move, like with all the counts and claps and stuff. <laughs> I am a lost puppy dog. Like I look disoriented and confused and I'm not counting anything. So I'm completely off beat because I have no idea how to count and dance at the same time. And so basically, if you want me to authentically be good at dancing, I can't have any choreography there. Okay. Is it bad that part of me wants to see you try to dance a dance and then also just see you bust some moves? Like a choreographed dance? Yeah, everyone would love to see that because it would be the biggest embarrassment on them. Maybe we should do that at the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not. Like when lockdown happened during the beginning of COVID and everyone was downloading TikTok and learning the Savage Dance with Megan the Stallion, I spent like two hours trying to learn that dance in my studio apartment and nothing was publishable. Oh. 
we will not make you have to dance choreographed dance. Thank you. Safe. Interpretive? Okay. I have won an interpretive dancing contest. That's impressive. Because I can express myself with music very easily. Nice. I know. Me and my sister won together. So that's like double freak show because we were twins and we won an interpretive dance contest. It was at like one of those races for like, it was like a cancer fundraiser. And they're like, we're going to do an interpretive dance contest. It was like one of those overnight fundraisers where you're there all night. And basically we won that. So what can I say? You're awesome. I was an adult. This is almost embarrassing, but it did happen. Why is it embarrassing? You were good enough to win the thing. That's not embarrassing. Have you watched the movie Napoleon Dynamite when he's doing like the birds? And No. Okay. My cultural reference is Monica and Ross dancing in Friends. Um, okay. Is there, would, that, would that look like that? Is there an interpretive dancing episode I didn't know about? No, but it's just the dance moves are interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's probably very much like that, too. <laughs> well, I am looking forward to our next interpretive dancing occasion. Me, too, which will happen at the retreat it will 100% happen at the retreat because that was a blast and such a success last year that we're doing it again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it wasn't required. So if you guys cringe at that idea, you don't have to do it. Oh so. yeah. This is the fun extra stuff in the evening time. Totally optional. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Super funzy. Fun. Funzo. <laughs> fun. Right. Shall we answer a question? <laughs> sure. Let's do it. Well, actually, it's not a question. It's a statement slash not sure how to approach this in recovery. Someone shared, I can't stop because my behaviors are automatic at this point. Mm. Well, I can say that I've been there. Have you been there? Oh, yeah. More so much. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you're at that place where it's automatic, it can feel really powerless and it can feel like impossible to reverse the behavior or stop the behavior, change things. But as coaches, part of our job is to really help you get to a point where you can build the awareness around the behavior and eventually make small changes to stop the behavior or reverse the behavior, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many ways we can break this down. I think, and tell me how you do this, but If I have a client with a very automatic behavior, the first thing we start to do is really dive into the details of what that automation looks like. And we build awareness around, you know, what triggers that behavior, what thoughts are surrounding that behavior, like what environmental factors are supporting that behavior or not. Building mindfulness around that, I think of it like we are detectives solving a mystery, right? We're getting really deep into what that automation looks like. So that when that client is in the moment, they can start to connect to that conversation we had and recognize, aha, I am suddenly in this experience that I thought was automated. And now I have some awareness and attention to it that Mm -hmm. I didn't have before. And then potentially, bing, change something about it. Might not fully change or stop the behavior, but work on changing it in the moment. I love that. It's so similar on my end, honestly. Like you said, it is important to know that one, you're not the only one who ends up sort of with automatic behaviors and wondering like, well, how am I going to stop if this is automatic? I find that finding a commonality in our experiences as humans and especially in recovery sort of helps us realize, oh, this isn't a me thing. That means that I'm going to be stuck with something. This is an eating disorder thing. This isn't a pattern thing. This is part of the experience. And because I'm not the only one and I'm just another human, there are opportunities for me to change. So this is sort of why we often, especially as coaches with lived experience, we will often sort of self-disclose in this way. It's not because it's about us, but it's rather because that's really normalizing the fact that something's part of the process and we can find a way out of it. That being said, if something became automatic, it can unbecome. 
automatic. Like literally, I do really want to also insist on this. Like you've learned, like when you brush your teeth right now, you probably don't think about brush, 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 turn my hand. Like, but when you were little, you had to learn at some point, probably poking your face with the toothbrush and your parents probably had to be able to hold your hand as you were doing it. And actually, if you try to brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand, you'll probably struggle. And yet you could train to make that as automatic as your dominant hand, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, your brain can go one way, it can go another way. I find that sort of stating, and I know it kind of sounds obvious, but sometimes stating these things can create already a little space where it's like, oh, I see a crack that sort of lets the light go through and I can see the opportunity of something different. And knowing that something different is possible can give enough hope to sort of kick us into, okay, then what can I do about it? And what can I change? And 100% agree with you. First step, data collection, creating awareness, because awareness equals opportunity for change. We're not going to change something if you're not aware of it. And it's really like you said, once we create understanding of patterns and contextual triggers and like, oh, this led to this and to that, and this is how I felt, and these are the thoughts I had, et cetera, et cetera. It's giving us the ability to pre-label certain things so that the next time you're in a similar situation, you're like, hold on a second. And mm -hmm. the other thing that I will often do for automatic behaviors is that if we know that it kicks in in a specific context, or for example, after that kind of a meal or every day around this time, like it's going to really depend on what we're talking about here. Then we can also very proactively plan to shift how we come to that moment. You know what I mean? Like one example is like body checking because body checking is, I remember body checking being so automatic and it was really hard to create that distance from it because even if I was noticing my patterns, I kept catching myself body checking instead of feeling like I was able to shift. And so instead, what I started setting as a goal was, well, I do realize that I'm body checking in this way when I, for example, enter my bathroom. So now I can proactively tell myself I'm going to go towards the bathroom when my hand touches the handle of the bathroom. This is the reminder that I'm using so that I'm going to enter the bathroom and proactively look at something else so that I'm not body checking, for example. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah. there are two things here. There's like this pre-labeling of like patterns and stuff gives you the awareness that can be enough for you in the moment to spot that you're in that pattern yeah. and create that distance and break the pattern. And you can proactively break the pattern before you start engaging in the pattern sort of a thing. Yeah, I really like how you brought that up. Like everyone watching, work with a coach or a therapist yeah. to help you determine those little points of like interception, right? Like where you can get in there and change. So for Anne Claire, it was the door handle. For some people, maybe putting a sticky note or yeah. big sign on your mirror. I love post-it notes. Yeah, like stop mm -hmm. body checking that's going to do something in your brain, right? That's going to start to rewire the very deeply ingrained neuro pathways. And I will have to say that in my experience, sometimes all you need is a little bit of that healthy self to show up, mm -hmm. right? That awareness, if you can get to that point of awareness and then let the healthy self speak up a little bit and say like, hey, you didn't want to do this today. <laughs> like, or Hey, just don't look at the mirror right now. Like, or. But exactly. Like, I love that you said that because I always say like, the point is the pause because in the pause, you can ask yourself what you actually want to do. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you will have worked with your team before on why is it that this isn't helpful? So you will know why you don't want to do the thing that you usually do in that moment. I so, so agree on this idea that the whole point is to create that Tiny little pause so that you can ask your healthy self, what are we doing? Absolutely. And I think it's all about finding that little crack to let the healthy self in. And one thing I ask my clients is like, okay, you engaged in this behavior again, which we've been trying to unpack, right? Say they come back and they got stuck back in the automated pattern. It's like, at what point did your healthy self show up at all? 
in that moment. And usually they say, oh, my healthy self really wasn't there, right? And so it's like, you got to find those moments where you can allow the healthy self in and try to do like an internal dialogue or just Mm -hmm. say a healthy self statement to get yourself out of the pattern. So, you know, think about the last time you used an automated behavior and say like, was the healthy self present or not? You know, and at what point would you like it to have shown up? You know, you can always redo it in your mind. I know that mentally just try again before you. Oh, that is so important. Actually, I often recommend clients to practice first Yeah, in their head because your brain doesn't know that much. Like, you know, that there's, if you've read the eight keys book, you will have read about this, how, (laughs) no, not you, but anyone watching, obviously you, you know them by heart at this point, (laughs) but Anyone that has the eight keys books will have read about how you can train your brain through visualization very, very, very well. And so when we're talking about these proactive breaks in the patterns that we're trying to introduce, I will so often suggest to clients, visualize making that happen. If I'm using my own example from earlier, I will say, spend some time, not when you actually already go to the bathroom, but spend some time visualizing going to the bathroom, placing your hand on the handle, remembering the thing that we talked about, entering the thing, not looking at your body in the way that you used to body check. And that is really going to help you because you're basically starting to use this new neural pathway in your brain without being yet in the action and that will make it more accessible when you are in the moment. So 100% practice before in your head. I love that. And the brain really doesn't know the difference between like real life and mental rehearsals. Like it just needs the visualization and for you to feel as if you had that experience of success a few times so that you can, again, take it to the real life experience and work on breaking that pattern. Mm -hmm. I will say for bigger behaviors that are more, I don't even know the right word, but like obvious, like for me, purging was a behavior I used. Being able to stop that automation and like insert my healthy self in the moment just once gave me a lot of encouragement and power and strength to keep trying to Mm -hmm. intercept that moment and to stop the behavior. Like for me, being able to surf the urge of that big behavior once or twice really transformed. Like it was a pivotal moment for me to be able to hold down my stressors and every, and Mm -hmm. the discomfort instead of reaching for relief. Right. And so I really encourage you guys to fight that internal battle, you know, if you can, because it does And from my experience, it was transformational just to do that a few times. I mean, it is radical proof that you can choose differently. Yeah. And when your eating disorder then says you can't do that, you can be like, no, I can. I've done it once. You know that that's not true anymore. And so it is transformational to realize, whoa, I can actually shift the way that I'm responding to something in such a fundamental way. It can be so empowering in recovery. So 100% agree with that. I will also add, be gentle with yourselves. Like it's not because you know that this is like the process and you can approach it in this way. We're not saying that suddenly you've done it once, you have to nail it every single time. Okay. We're still not coming in with black and white thinking. We're still not coming in with perfectionism and like harsh judgment, et cetera. Things will change. Context will be a little bit different. Sometimes extra things will happen around you know, that day, that behavior, whatever. And so it will be harder. That's not a reason to suddenly just quit and be like, well, that's not for me. No, that means that there's more data to collect and more lessons to learn. So, you know. I love that. Like there's progress in like stopping a behavior one time. And then there's process in stopping a behavior some of the times, but not all of the times, Mm -hmm. right? And it is a grayscale and an up and down process to get to the point where you're no longer ever doing the behavior. So I love that you pointed out all or nothing. That's cool. (laughs) But yeah, I am grateful that we could have this little discussion today, Anne-Claire. And I think everyone listening, just take away here 
is really think about working with a coach to unpack everything going around when it comes to the automated behaviors that you're having and just find those glimmers where the healthy self can come in, right? And show up and help you in that moment. I love that. Thank you, Meg. You're awesome. Thanks, Sam Claire. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye.